So I want to say this as a word of encouragement as we begin, um, that <clears throat> like as a retreat master, my job is to, to try to work with our Lord and with you in, in helping to, to open up space wherever space needs to be opened up in relationship and, um, and really like in my own priesthood. Um, I just try to pass on to, to others what, what our Lord has done for me. And, but, but sometimes people have a perception that, like, oh, that happened that one day, and then you were good. And, like, just some encouragement. Like, <laughs> like I went on a retreat, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to repent of something. I don't want to do that. And then, like, three months later, um, our Lord brought it up again, and I was like, okay, We'll talk about it. And then a couple months later, my therapist brought up something similar and I was like, okay. And, and then finally, like my next retreat, like is when I got to the point of actually praying through some things. So, um, so just, just like, remember that it's, it's about the journey. The spiritual life is about the journey. And, um, but tonight what I want to talk about are, are two other kind of places where we get stuck and 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 there're just two other just obstacles to relationship with our lord and um they're they're both the places that we get stuck and they're also like the the places that we heal and and those two places are grief and forgiveness and so in my last talk, I talked about the rich young man who goes to our Lord with this desire to live. The Lord says, stop sinning. I've done that since my youth. The Lord looks at him and loves him and says, go sell everything you have and follow me. And then the next line that we all know is that he went away sad. And, and the he went away sad is sometimes portrayed as well, he wasn't able to do it. But it also can be portrayed as, oh, then he had to go into a grieving process. Because even when we want to follow our Lord with our whole heart, and that means leaving some things behind, we have to grieve those things. Like grief is a gift that God gave us to make space for new relationships. You know, it's a gift God gave us to make space for new relationships. And, and so, like, I know I walked with a couple once in my first assignment, and, and they were so in love, and she was a young mom who had cancer. And, uh, and she ended up living another two years after I left that assignment, and then she died. And her husband was sure he would never be able to love anybody ever again. And then over time, he grieved. And then all of a sudden, like, he's shown up at mass with this other person. And, and like, they're, like, two little teenagers. And all, like, the longtime married couples are, like, jealous of them and talking about how they're, you know, they're disgustingly in love with each other. And, and, and they have a beautiful family. And, and so, like, through the grieving process, it makes space for a new relationship. And when we don't grieve, it's usually because our grief is so painful that we just don't want to go near it. And so if we don't grieve, it doesn't leave space. In my own life, my mother died when I was two. And, uh, and I gr was grieving like a two-year-old grieves, which is to say that I would introduce myself. My name's Sean, my mom died. Like, I was just trying to tell everybody about it. And, and then for some reason, socially, that was unacceptable. And so I started to be told, like, like don't stop telling people that. And, and then I never actually grieved. And, and then later on in my priesthood, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, stuck in my relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, 
And, you know, I, I, I have a devotion to Mary. Like, lots of people have a devotion to Mary. I pray the rosary, you know. I do my thing. I pray the Angelus. And, and um, you know, and then, you know, my friends who are like these charismatic ladies usually. Charismatic ladies. <laughs> they come by my office and they're like, Father, I just want you to know that Mary really loves you. I'm like, shut up. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. And so that happened for a little while, and it was also a lot of religious sisters would tell me that. And, um, and then finally, you know, more, and it was even more recently, I just realized, like, oh, I have to grieve that. And, and I have some really great people that God has put in my life that have helped me do that. And, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm like, whoa, this is what it's like to have a relationship with Mary. Like, there's something good there. But, but I wasn't really open to it because I'd been hurt before. And, and so grief is, it's a way that we heal. And, and grief is sneaky. There's, like, sneaky grief. <clears throat> because we don't just have to grieve, like, what we had that we don't have anymore. We have to grieve into the future everything that we thought we were going to be, but now it's not possible. And so, so what I mean by that, and, and um, it's also going to bleed into when I talk about forgiveness, is that when we suffer losses, and this can be any kind of suffering, like human beings suffer because, particularly because, we can imagine our life to be different than it is. And only human beings are capable of this. Like animals don't daydream. Animals don't sit around and think, like a dog doesn't wonder, what would it be like to be a cat? Like, like they just don't like sit around and ruminate um, like we do. Human beings can look into a sky, the sky and see a bird flying and say, I want to do that and do it. And, and so all of us, we, we sort of carry our past and we live in the present moment. And then we have an imagined future of what I think my life's going to be like in the future. And, and all suffering happens when there's some event that renders our imagined future now impossible. Some event renders our imagined future now impossible. So, like my friend who had cancer with her two, with her small children, like she not only suffered the fact that she had cancer and couldn't get out of bed, she suffered the fact that she was not going to go to her son's graduation or her daughter's wedding or Thanksgivings as a family with grandchildren, or meet her grandchildren. Like, you start thinking about all those things, and then those become this, this imagined life. It can happen in, in sickness. Like, I, I always use Joe Theismann as an example. So if you're old like me, he was an NFL quarterback who... Had his leg broken on, like, Monday Night Football, I think. And so he has an imagined future, like, I'm going to play in another Super Bowl. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then this thing happens, and now there's this life I thought I should have, and then there's this life I'm actually living. And, and the measure of our suffering is proportionate to the distance between what I thought my life was going to be and what my life actually is. All right, so I might get a cold, and I have, I'm like sneezing all day. And so the distance between like is like this much. All right, like I break my leg and the distance between is like this much. Even in terms of like, what am I going to do today? A parent dies unexpectedly. You know, whatever that thing is, it creates that, that gap. And, and we suffer because we're holding those two realities at the same time. And we're constantly thinking about like what our life would be if only. And sometimes I call it the should be life that we live in our heads. Like 12 step people, I think particularly Al-Anon people, they have an expression they always use, stop shooting on yourself. <clears throat> and, and it's when we live in kind of the tyranny of the should.
And so resolving that gap, right, it really means, like, Jesus has a similar gap in his life. Because he is the son of God who became sin. Right? He has this should-be life of eternal gaudium, eternal joy in communion with the Father. But then he empties himself and takes the form of a slave. He embraces his cross. He takes on himself the sin of the whole world. So his gap is an infinitely wide gap, and, and the way it resolves in his life comes from St. Paul's letter where he says, though he was in the form of God, he didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped at or something to be held on to. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave being born in the likeness of men. He embraced this cross. And so the thing that has to be surrendered to resolve it is the should be. And, and then we invite our Lord into our life where our life is. And it, it sounds like, Jesus, I offer you the life where my mom never died. And I grew up in a family with my two other brothers my entire life. And I have a close bond with them. And I invite you into the life I live now where my mom died and I'm from a family with three different sets of siblings and we're not all that close. And, you know, I never played team sports. Like, and like, whatever that sounds like, Jesus, I offer you the life where I never broke my leg. And I invite you into my life right now as it is. And, and it helps to, to sort of resolve that because as long as we're holding on to the shoulds, then it becomes an obstacle to encounter. Now, whenever we're holding on to the shoulds, it becomes an obstacle to encounter. And those shoulds, that should be life, it also turns into resentment because we're constantly measuring our life against that standard. And, and so letting go of those resentments or forgiving those resentments, like, like the thing that we have to forgive is, is usually like what we lost and what we lost is on the should be line. And, and so what we grieve is like on the should be line, what we lost on the should be line, what we forgive is on the should be line. In Matthew's gospel, Peter goes to our Lord and he says, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. And, and so our Lord reminds us that forgiveness becomes something that we have to constantly do. And because he's very aware of our human nature, he's very aware of the fact that we have a tendency to live in the should. And so, so I, f I can find myself forgiving the same person for the same thing as often as I find myself living in resentment. And, and it just might pop at different times in different circumstances. And, and when I catch it, I have to like step back and say, Jesus, I offer you the life where? And in the name of Jesus, I forgive this person for this action. And forgiveness is, it can be a hard thing because sometimes the obstacle to forgiveness is reconciliation or our desire for reconciliation and what i mean by that is that forgiveness is a is a one-way street reconciliation is a two-way street so reconciliation is when somebody hurts me i go to them and i say you hurt me and they say oh my gosh i am so sorry what can i do to fix it and they say, will you forgive me? And I say, I forgive you. And we start to work together and move together toward a future. Forgiveness is like forgiving a debt. 
So I always use the $20 example. Like somebody might, I might loan somebody $20. And then I see them a week later. And now in my expectation, my should be line is they're going to give me my $20 back. But they don't. We have a nice chat. They kind of talk about, you know, the weather. And they say, have a good day. And they leave. And I'm like, that guy didn't even bring up my 20 bucks. He owes me $20. And I started to like think about the $20 he owes me. And it's taken up a lot of my mental space. And then I see him a week later. Same thing. Okay, surely he's going to give me my 20 bucks. And he doesn't. Doesn't mention it. Go on. He's distracted. I'm in resentment. Eventually, I might just say, you know what? I forgive the debt. You don't have to pay me back. And I do that internally, I might do that externally, but what I'm really doing is I'm relieving myself of the burden of thinking about the $20 that he owes me all the time. That doesn't fix the relationship. I'm not gonna have a relationship with him. I'm not gonna loan him $20 again. But it's just on my side of the fence. And, and that's what the Lord exhorts Peter about is you have to forgive seven, 77 times, right? Or seven times 70, seven, 70 times seven times in another translation or another book of the Bible. Because we have to do that to keep the space open because otherwise resentment, it just sets in and it gets in the way and it slows us down and and it gets triggered by things, and we pretend like it doesn't matter, and it really does. And we can have resentments towards people. We can have resentments towards institutions. I was in a meeting a few years ago, and I was like, I have a resentment against the coronavirus, just a, in general, like a virus. We can have a resentment against God. Um, there's all uh, there's all kinds of places where we can be, you know, we can hold those things, and and there's a, the only way of clearing it is forgiveness, because at the root of all of that is, I think I know better than the Lord what my life is supposed to look like right now. Like that's the truth of it is. When I'm living in that place, I think I know better than Jesus what my life is supposed to look like right now. And as long as I'm thinking that, then I'm God and he's not God. And then, of course, I don't feel connected to him. And so grief and resentment, they can kind of be interlocked. The grief and unforgiveness can be interlocked because sometimes we have grief and it's also connected to a resentment against somebody or some institution or God because of the loss that we've had. And, and so this forgiveness exercise that I want to, I want to just kind of lead you through a way of praying and it's an invitation for you to enter in as much or as little as you're comfortable and in order to just become familiar. And, um, and so the, the, uh, the kind of outline of the, the way the process works, and, and then I'll just guide you through it and we'll pray with it together, is we're going to pray to the Holy Spirit and just ask the Holy Spirit to show you just an area of your life that needs forgiveness. Could be a person, could be an institution, it could be God, it could be yourself. Just like, where do you need to extend forgiveness? And, and when we pray to the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit, then we just try to stay open to whatever comes. And, and if it might be kind of uncomfortable. Like for me, I kind of, last time I did this, I, I had an idea who I was going to forgive and the Holy Spirit was like, nope. Because somebody else came up really strongly. And, and so you just try to stay open to whatever comes. And then we're going to imagine that that person, we just use our imaginations to invite that person to be with us and, and imagine them as if they're standing right in front of us. Now, if that's really hard to do, then 
you might try inviting Jesus and Mary and St. Joseph to also be there as your support. And, and in your imagination, you might look around and see them and, and just notice where are they standing? How are they relating to you? Where is this other person? And then we'll make an account of what they did and kind of an inventory of what they did. And then in your imagination, you just speak that out loud and just let them have it. This is what you did. This is how it affected me. You can swear. You can get really angry. Like whatever happens in that moment. But, but it's the purpose of it is to make an account of everything that's on that should be line. Like everything that needs to be let go of. And then after that, we'll ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what you might believe about yourself based on that incident. Because when, when we have unforgiveness or unresolved grief, we can have identity lies. Like identity lies like, I'm not good enough. I'm a lesser person. Um, I'll never be loved. I'll never be able to trust anybody. I'm all alone. Those are all identity lies that can happen because of, of hurts that we carry. And then we'll renounce those. And, that, and then we'll just, I'll just invite you to say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie, that, and then whatever came. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'll never, I'll never be secure in my family. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I don't belong in my family. Um, just whatever those things are. And then the next step is to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal judgments that we hold towards that person. And, and it sounds weird. One time I, I was teaching this and somebody said, well, is it really a judgment if it's true? Because right, I have judgments about people. Like, I'm pretty sure I know the entire interior life of certain people. And I might be right, but that doesn't matter. Because if I'm making that judgment and holding on to that judgment, again, I'm putting myself in the place of our Lord and I'm kind of taking that role from him. And, it, and it's better for me to just let him do it and trust that he can pass judgment and he's perfectly capable of doing that. And I can trust him to do it so I don't have to carry the burden. And we'll renounce those judgments. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the judgment that this person is a complete narcissist. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the judgment that whatever it is. And then we'll just pray a short prayer asking Jesus to forgive that person. And then as you're comfortable in your freedom, we'll pray a prayer of forgiveness for that person. And then, and then there's another renouncing of any interior vows that we hold. And... Uh, and then I'll just pray a prayer over everybody asking our Lord to, to close out that time. And, and so that's just kind of a roadmap that I wanted to walk you through so you're not surprised by anything. And, and again, I'm just inviting you to um, be as open as, as you feel you're able to what our Lord desires to do for you. And there might be some things that got stirred up during the day. There might be some things that we've been holding on to. There might be some things that just came to mind now. And so we'll pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and just make yourself comfortable. And we're just going to begin by praying to the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit to show us who is it in our life or what institution or whether it's ourself, whether it's God, who needs forgiveness. We'll pray together. Just repeat after me. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Just interiorly ask the Holy Spirit to show you where there's a need to extend forgiveness.
And as that person or institution comes to mind, just, just picture them in front of you in your imagination. And again, if that's difficult or scary, just take some time to invite Jesus, Mary, St. Joseph to be there with you. And make an account of the debt they owe you. What did they do? Or what did they not do? What should they have done? What did you lose? Where did they fail? and how that has affected your life. And as that comes to mind in your prayer, you just let them have all of that. Picture yourself telling them everything that they did, everything they took from you. Whatever you imagine your life would have been like. It's okay to be angry. And just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you any identity lies that you've been carrying. Things like, I'm not good enough. I'm not supposed to be happy. I'm unlovable. I'm always going to be alone.
And then I invite you to renounce those. And so again, just praying on your own or just under your breath. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm not good enough. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm unlovable. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm not worthy of happiness. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm incompetent. I'm just praying to the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any judgments that you hold. Holy Spirit, we ask you to reveal whatever judgments we hold in our hearts towards those people or that person. And we renounce those similarly. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the judgment that. And now I invite you to just <clears throat> lead that person or transition that person to the foot of the cross to take them to our Lord. And just pray a prayer asking our Lord to forgive them. And then in your freedom, as you're comfortable, I invite you to pray a direct prayer of forgiveness for them, which might sound like, in the name of Jesus, I forgive this person for this way that they hurt me.
And then in your freedom, just invite you to pray a prayer of blessing over that person. Just asking God to bless them in the opposite way that they hurt you. So if it's somebody that stole from you, you ask God to bless them with, you know, an abundance. If it was somebody who, like, neglected you, you ask God to bless them, like, with affirmation. To just ask our Lord to bless them in, in whatever way that they, the opposite way that they hurt you. And then just leave that person with our Lord at the foot of the cross and whoever it was, if it was Mary or St. Joseph or whoever seems most comforting to you, I'd go to that person. And just let them respond to you. Now just pray a prayer to close out this time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we ask you to seal this forgiveness in, in the hearts of these, your beloved sons and daughters. And just ask you to help us to continue to live in the journey and to be free of all resentment, to be free of all unforgiveness, to be free of all attachments so that our hearts may be open to the new life that you desire for us. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we've got about 20 minutes until night prayer, and I'll be in the confessional and, and just invite you to continue. If, if you were kind of in the middle, to just Stick that out as you're comfortable. Um, check in with your heart. And just kind of process with our Lord who is present with us. Whatever else is going on in, in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit.